Give it away. Give it away, Frank. Frank. All right. So thank you uh, for that great introduction uh, just now. And uh, thank you for inviting us for this uh, great community uh, conference uh, online. And so uh, this picture right now, this is uh, what uh, where we should have been today. This is the Microsoft office uh, in the Netherlands. Unfortunately, this event could not be uh, an, an in-person uh, event, but uh, luckily uh, Christian and his team has have been able to transform this uh, into an online event, uh, gathering even more people uh, today. So we're excited uh, about that. So. Uh, since this is a community conference, we decided to have this our, uh, our title slide. This is uh, taken at the last MVP summit in 2019, when we were still able to uh, fly around uh, the world and meet up uh, there. So in this photo, many of the RDS and uh, WVD uh, product team members, as well as many fellow MVPs uh, as well. And uh, yeah, we hope to see everyone uh, in good health uh, again soon and meet up uh, in person. Uh, also special credits to uh, Thomas Poppelgaard, who will be presenting uh, right after us. Uh, he was uh, the one who took this picture uh, using his drone. So uh, thank you uh, for that and credits to him. Yeah. And uh, as an introduction, yeah, my name is Frank Bersman. I'm from the Netherlands. I work for a company called Wartel. We are a system integrated cloud integrator focusing on a Microsoft platform. Uh, and I primarily focus on anything that's related to uh, end user computing. So RDS, VDI, remote app, mostly on the Azure platform. Uh, also work at RDS Gurus and have been a Microsoft MVP for many years uh, as well. So with me is uh, my co-presenter, Micha, all the way from Belgium. Do you want to introduce yourself, Micha? Yes, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Micha Wetz. Uh, I'm a cloud architect, so I'm independent uh, solution provider, uh, in independent uh, architect. I work at Aspex, which is a cloud solution uh, provider from the Belgium community, uh, from Belgium. I am part of two awesome Belgian community groups, Tech9 and MC2MC. Uh, we host a lot of community sessions and it's awesome to be part of that. Not as Freek, um, I am a junior MVP. Uh, Freek has been around for many years. I just uh, am awarded once and hope to be awarded again. But I, uh, I love to be part of the community and do my, uh, my part of the community jobs. All right. So uh, let's get started. And uh, we're actually starting with one of the slides that Christian also has, the introduction of WVD uh, as a general availability uh, uh, last year. So Micha and I, we have seen, uh, both have seen a huge demand for the Windows Virtual Desktop service. Uh, so why is that? If you think about what the service actually does, application and desktop uh, delivery using a remoting protocol, uh, that's not new, right? We've been doing that for many years, uh, two decades even. Uh, but what makes WVD interesting, uh, many, uh, many features, as uh, Christian in his previous session already explained, but for a big part, it's all about the fact that we do not have to worry anymore about our infrastructure roles. We do not have to set up any infrastructure roles to be able to host our desktops and deliver them to our end users. So which means we can now focus on what's really important, which is the end user experience and the perceived end user experience. So optimizing that for the end user, uh, and a big part of that is obviously uh, the application landscape, and that's our topic uh, for this session. So when you think about end user computing in a broader uh, sense, this is not only applicable to uh, Windows Virtual Desktop, but also to Citrix, VMware, or any other virtualized environment, and even any um, physical devices, they all consist of three main parts. So the first part is the applications. So a big part of it, uh, we need to ensure that the user has the right applications but for his role or for his uh, department. Uh, and the second piece of the puzzle is the user profile and the user data. So we need to make sure that the user's profile and data is available if he roams devices or if he roams uh, multiple voltage machines within, for example, a WVD environment. Last piece of the puzzle is the Windows operating system. Uh, in this case, let's assume it's uh, Windows 10. So we make, need to make sure that that operating system uh, remains as well for the end user. So when you take a look at that from a physical workstation or physical laptop or desktop uh, perspective, these uh, three puzzles uh, are, the puzzle parts are tied together. They're closely coupled, right? So if I have a physical device, I have all of my applications, all of my user data, all of my user profile, and the operating system are uh, available locally. 
So not that many challenges, or at least different challenges. Uh, but when we make the transition towards Windows Virtual Desktop, that becomes different. And it becomes different because uh, in most cases, we'll probably be using a set of multiple virtual machines, most likely based on Windows 10 multi-user, uh, which means that we have a host pool of different hosts uh, that contain the same applications, but me as an end user, I could end up on VM number one on Monday, and I could end up on VM number 15, for example, on Tuesday. So how do we make sure that all of the pieces of the puzzle remain when the user roams across multiple virtual machines? And this is because the WVD service actually routes the user uh, to a VM uh, that's part of a host pool where his resources in terms of applications or desktops are available. So for a big part, the WVD service take care of the OS. If we deploy a host pool, we do that based on a, a template image that has the operating system. So that really remains uh, when the user logs off and logs on to a different service. So let's take a look at two of the other uh, parts of the puzzle, the applications, and eventually the big part of, uh, of this talk is uh, the applications. So we'll hand it over to Micha. We'll talk to you about um, the profile uh, part of this puzzle uh, based on Avis Logics technology. Yes, thank you, Freek. As Christian already mentioned, Avis Logics uh, technology is really important for Windows Virtual Desktop. Microsoft bought uh, Avis Logics at the end of 2018. Uh, including all uh, the three parts of FS Logics that were available at that time. We're going to cover two of the three today. So the profile container, app masking, and Java redirection are part of the suite. Today we will focus on profile container and app masking. Profile container, that's the technology uh, that will replace your roaming profile and folder redirection because your profile is no longer stored on a file server as a simple folder. It is now stored into a VHD or VHDX file. It contains the entire profile, so not only roaming, but also the local. And it speeds up the logon process because the profile is not copied to the session host. It's only mounted on the session host. So the profile remains on the file server and it's just simply attached to the session host where the user is signing into and is directly available for the user. Also recommended and necessary for Windows Virtual Desktop if you want to use Outlook, etc. So really important part of uh, Windows Virtual Desktop. Second topic is the app masking. Um, the app masking will reduce the amount of golden images because you can install all software in one golden image and just hide the applications to specific part of your user group by using app masking. Um, it's really ideal if you really want to install all applications on your golden image, but as we will see later on in this topic, in this session, it's not the way forward, we think. Java redirection uh, will help um, to pinpoint applications and websites to the correct Java version, but this is not something that we will cover today. Next, we will go to the profile container. Uh, profile container is the first part. It will detach your profile from your session host. So it really separates the user profile from your virtual machine. For the end user, it doesn't change because for the end user, it's still its normal profile behavior and the profile is still available for the session host. So the user can still store his files on the desktop or in his documents. It's all just a link to the file server and, and it's just uh, available for the user. Oh, so each user gets its own container. So each user gets its VHD or VHDX file and it's completely separated from all the other users. So this is part, and this is the, the first piece, uh, the second piece of the puzzle. Uh, but what about the applications? Yeah, so let's uh, take a look at the main topic of this uh, session, dealing with application landscapes on top of Windows Virtual Desktop. Uh, let's take a look at some of the current options that are available uh, today. The most common option I think is used is option number one is using multiple images per role. 
So if I have multiple departments, I can create a multiple different uh, template images. So basically VMs that I spin up in Azure, I install my applications, I sysprep them and change them into a template image. I can deploy then different host pools for different departments or different uh, parts of my organization. Um, so uh, let's take a look at it in the demo on how to uh, deploy that using uh, using ARM templates and update that uh, for a uh, specific uh, template. So switching to the uh, Azure portal, actually, let me uh, show you what's, uh, what's been uh, configured right now for uh, Windows Virtual Desktop. Uh, and this is a lab environment where I have uh, two uh, machines running, two session host servers running based on a specific uh, version. So this is uh, 2003, so this is my version number indicating that this is um, the, the March edition of my uh, 2020 um, template. So if I go to the uh, Azure portal and I go into the resource group I have uh, configured here, we can see that I have multiple template images already available. So these were prior, these were just VMs running in Azure, but I have sysprepped them, allocate, uh, deallocated them and uh, changed them into a template image. So right now we are using this template image. This is the uh, March uh, template containing my application landscape. And I already went ahead and created a new template image uh, for April using my uh, the same template technology that contains the application updates for uh, for this month. So these are based on a uh, different uh, version of per month, but you can also, uh, of course, have them for different departments, uh, different uh, types of your organization. So if I were to deploy this, uh, I could go in into the Azure portal itself and deploy it uh, from there. But instead, I'm using a custom ARM template that I developed, which uh, allows me to um, add existing uh, add new session host service to the existing uh, WVD host pool. So if I create this uh, this template here, I can specify uh, a lot of parameters, including, of course, uh, the subscription and the resource group I want to deploy this in. Uh, but also I have customized this to make it easier for any sysadmin to uh, deploy this. So I have here a drop down list, for example, to pre-select uh, the tenant I want to use. I can select uh, the host pool I want to deploy this in. Uh, but also, for example, I have a nice drop down list uh, to allow me to select the organizational unit where I want to deploy this. So you don't need to copy and paste in the distinguished name here. I can easily select them from a drop down list. So talking about the image, I have a drop down list here of all of the image versions that are currently available. So I can just go ahead and select the latest image version, uh, do all of the other parameters, like for example, the number of VMs, the sequence number I want to start in, the sizing, et cetera. So what this template does is it creates uh, a set of session host servers based on the number I specify, uh, deploys the VMs, it adds to the VMs to the domain, and then adds the VMs to the host pool and also drains these uh, VMs. And this allows me to have a good uh, transition and decide later on uh, which moment I want to choose to be able to use this new template image. So just a quick overview of how that's used uh, in a custom template image. So that's the first option, as we said, that's probably the one that's being used uh, mostly uh, today. It also has a couple of downsides because if I have to want to have multiple images for multiple departments or for multiple types of users, I need to manage and maintain all of these uh, template images, make sure they're updated, etc. So let's take a look at a second option. Uh, Micha, you want to talk about that? Yes. Second option is the traditional app layering. Um, this means that uh, this has the, the cause that your image can get bloated. You need additional policies and app licensing could be really a challenge because not all software vendors will accept this technology or will accept that you will assign policies to protect your software and that you don't have to buy licenses for this. So that's not always a good option. The third option is the app streaming, for example, app fee. This requires that uh, each time a user is signing in or needs an application, that operating system needs to download and cache the software on the session host. Next to that, you also need additional streaming infrastructure because AppFeed also needs a streaming server. And also the, the repackaging and the sequencing of an application can be challenging each time. Now we want to do a demo on app masking uh, to show you how you can use app masking to hide, for example, Acrobat Reader. I will just quickly share my screen. Oh, 
over here we have test user one. That's not the correct one. Okay, test user two is connected to my Mika Win 10 pool. Uh, I'm on a session host. The user has a test PDF file. When we open it, it uses the standard Acrobat reader. Also, when the user is going to the C program files Adobe, it sees the Acrobat reader folder. So it turns up you, but you don't uh, share your screen right now. You don't see my screen? Can you see it now? That is better, yes. Oh, okay, awesome. Let me restart. So this is my test user too. Um, he can launch the test Acrobat file using the Acrobat reader. And he can also see in the C program files Adobe, the Acrobat reader folder. So he can really launch the, the Acrobat reader. When I go to my Micha Wits, he's connected to the same virtual machine and the same principle. He has permissions to launch a PDF file. Now let me go to my admin console. This is my admin session. We have the FS Logix app rule editor. Using this editor, we can create app masking rules. I will do this quickly. I'm going to create a new, put it on the desktop, call it Acrobat Reader. I'm going to let FS Logix do all the magic. So I will select Acrobat Reader from the installed programs. And FS Logix will now scan both disk and registry for all entries regarding Acrobat Reader. As you can see, we have a folder. We have a rule for the, the registry below as well. Now we're going to make an assignment. We're going to add a user. You can search Active Directory. We're going to add our test user. Our test user here was our test user two. So test user two will be added to the policy. So this hiding rule will be applied to test user two. Now we have two files. One is our rule file, and the second one is the assignment file. This is not applied yet. If you want to apply this on a session host, you have to add it to the program files FS Logix app rules. This is something that we will do right now. And as soon as the files are in, you will see a brief blinking of the applications. This means that the policy is indeed assigned. If we go to our Michawets, which is not inflicted by the policy, he still can use Acrobat as before. But if we go back to our test user, you will see, even though the user is signed in, he no longer sees a folder in the Adobe folder. And when he launches the test PDF, it will be using Edge as the second in line of PDF files. If you want to show an application, it's the same way. We just simply remove our rules from the session host. Again, the blinking, go back to the test user. He still, he now has access again to the Acrobat Reader folder. And he can start using Acrobat Reader again. So using app masking, it is possible to hide an application for a user and show an application again to the user, even though the user is logged in. And this is called live entitlement changes. Back to you, Freek. Yes, so back to the slide deck. So we talked about uh, three different ways to uh, to take a look at uh, or to deal with application landscapes on top of uh, Windows Virtual Desktop. And uh, let's now take uh, the next uh, step. So uh, what if we would be able to uh, attach and detach applications from the operating system, similar to attaching and detaching profiles that we earlier saw using FS Logix technology? So uh, drum rolls, uh, but it is as actually here. So it's called MSIX App Attach. Uh, it basically consists of two different parts. One of the MSIX part, which is uh, existing technology. If you're not familiar with that, it's a new way of dealing with application installs and can eventually replace uh, MSI and uh, executable installs. 
Uh, but for a big part, uh, the benefit is that it's uh, based on a declarative install, which means that we know exactly where uh, applications uh, make changes when they are installing them. And we're 100% sure that when that application is uninstalled, it does not leave anything behind. Uh, it has a simple deployment. It can be used uh, and deployed on a per user model, and it's entirely managed by the operating system as part of MSIX technology. So MSIX Appetite then leverages that same technology and makes sure that we can use it inside uh, virtualized environments as uh, Windows Virtual Desktop. So it uses the native format that comes with an MSIX package, so we do not need to repackage that MSIX application. We can also change uh, or transform existing MSI uh, installments, installments into MSIX. Um, and they are stored off the Windows disk, so they do not remain uh, they're not installed on the disk of the session host operating system, but uh, they're mounted from a share, which can be a, a regular Windows share or file server, as well as Azure files. Uh, and we can then are able to add application groups, uh, assign them uh, to users, and have applications available instantly. So uh, a big part of it is that for uh, the end user uh, logging onto the system, as well as for the operating system, this is fully transparent. So it has the look and feel of any other MSIX applications. There's nothing different. And from the operating system, it also uh, is uh, just a, another local uh, MSIX application. So we're going to see it in a demo uh, in just a second. But before we do that, I want to quickly take you over the terminology uh, when it comes to MSIX Appetite to make sure we're all on the same uh, page here. So when we're talking about expanding MSIX, we're talking about taking an existing MSIX package, whether it's uh, an output from a conversion or a uh, MSAX application out of the box. And we transform that into an app package, which means that we transform it basically into a VHD or VHDX file. We don't have the process of staging the application. That means that we actually attach the application. So that's available on the WVD host. And destaging obviously is removing it again. Then we have the process of registering the application, which means that the application now becomes available to the end user. So either all of the users or just a subset, uh, and deregistering is uh, removing that application again. We also can do delayed registration to make sure that not all applications are registered during logon, but some of them are delayed to, fat, to uh, speed up the logon process, or uh, optionally have them um, registered on demand uh, as soon as the user clicks the application. So staging usually takes place on the boot of the operating system. Uh, and so in that case, the WD host has the, uh, um, the packages available, and the registering part usually takes place on uh, the user logon. So let's take a look at that in a demo. I have uh, the Windows Virtual Desktop client available here, and as you can see, I have uh, a set of a remote app published and a, few, a couple of full desktops based on uh, different tenants. And I have uh, a full desktop uh, open here. So I'm now logged on as an end user on this uh, WPD host. And uh, let's take a look at the start menu and search for Notepad. As you can see, I only have the, um, the inbox Notepad version available. There's no uh, Notepad++ available. So let's go ahead, go ahead and add that one. So I have uh, two scripts here. One takes place, uh, one takes, um, uh, one performs the staging and attaching of the applications. I uh, deliberately um, converted that into a single PowerShell script to easily show that in a demo, uh, but this obviously does the staging part usually done at boot up and the attaching part using uh, usually done at logon. So when I run this uh, script, it takes a couple of seconds to uh, complete. So again, this takes the staging and the attaching uh, as well. If I now search for the start menu, I now suddenly have a Notepad++ application available. If I open it up, it has the look and feel of any uh, native MSIX, in this case, application. I can interact it with it uh, in the same way. Also note that it came with a update. Uh, message. So we deliberately did that because we'll cover how to update these applications uh, in the next part uh, as well. So how did this work? Uh, we talked about the share where these VCX files are amount, and this is that share. So as you can see, I have the uh, MSAX application here. This is the one that I used uh, using the transformation tool to transform the existing installer into an MSAX package. And I have the VHD file that's actually mounted on this operating system right now. So if you take a look at the location where this is all being mounted, if you go to C program files, Windows apps, this is the location where all of your MSIX packages are um, maintained, as well as the one that we just uh, mounted right here. 
So if we take a look at the uh, disk management, we can clearly see that I have a new disk attached to this operating system, and this disk actually points to this location, right? So if I browse to this location, I redirect it to the mounted disk of Notepad++. Uh, similarly, I can also detach it. So even if the application is uh, running, you probably won't, do not want to do that for your live uh, user uh, logon. But for the sake of the demo, let's now uh, detach and destage the application, uh, and it will be removed uh, again. So the application is now removed from the uh, user context using the detach, uh, and also de uh, destage. So if I now switch for the start menu, the application is now gone again. So this allows us to easily uh, add and remove applications for a subset of users on a uh, even on a live system as well. Obviously, this is all based on manual uh, PowerShell scripts for uh, during the preview uh, period and as well as uh, this demo. I want to take it to the to the next step, and that is actually automating some of this stuff uh, into uh, Azure DevOps. So let's uh, go back to the slide, and I think I'm going to hand it over to you, Micha, to um, have you talk about um, automating some of these steps using um, Microsoft DevOps. Yes, thank you. Let me share my screen. Hopefully the sharing goes well now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is an overview of the DevOps tooling that is available from Microsoft and has with GitHub uh, features as well. Today, we're only going to focus on two of them, uh, Azure Repos and Azure Pipelines. These are the two parts of the Azure DevOps, uh, Azure DevOps suite that we're going to use. What are we going to do? We're going to create a CI CD pipeline. So in Visual Studio Code, we're going to push our changes to the branch. In our repo, we're going to pull this into the master. Our master will trigger our continuous integration. After the build, we will have a continuous deployment. So the release will start deploying. And the new MSIX version of our application will be pushed into an Azure file share. Now that Azure File Share is also available to be joined in Windows Active Directory, we're going to use Azure File Share that is joined into our Active Directory and stream the application in our Windows Virtual Desktop environment. Marcel created an awesome um, script and an awesome uh, deployment uh, for MSIX. He didn't know we were going to mention him, but Marcel, um, my kudos to you. Um, it is a implementation of a PowerShell script, which will do the staging and the registration for uh, both virtual machine and uh, the users. Um, and he's using a JSON file for this. So there is a one PowerShell script with parameters, and um, that, par uh, that PowerShell script will get its input from a JSON file, and in the JSON file, we simply describe the applications and the users that needs to be assigned to the applications, and everything is done using group policy. So no manual running of PowerShell scripts. It's all done using a JSON, describing the applications, and using the group policies from our Windows Active Directory. How does this work? Let me, let's have an overview. This is my domain controller. It has a group policy with loopback uh, enabled in merge. We have our PowerShell scripts with the power the, with the JSON as a config file, and we specify if it's a VM start. We have the, the computer policy on startup, which has a VM start, VM shutdown, user logon, and user logoff. This is, as Freak mentioned, the uh, staging and destaging and the registration and uh, deregistration phases of our user. We have a um, Azure file share, which is joined into our Active Directory, so we can set NTFS permissions on that. And we have in the packages folder, our MSX and our VHD. And in the scripts, we have our JSON objects. For the users, this is all seamless, so they don't even realize what is going on. If we go for my Michael Wetz 
user, which is uh, now connected to MSX pool, there we see that the notepad is installed virtually for this user. He can work with it, but it is version 771. So it's an old version, as you can see, June 16, 2019. Now, to prove to you that it is MSIX, this is my test user one, connected to the same virtual machine, but he will not be able to start Notepad++. He will only have Notepad, so the same as in Frix, his demo. Only Notepad is available to this user. If you go to our Visual Studio code, this is the JSON file uh, Marcel created. It describes a few things. It describes where the PhD is located. This is our Azure file share. The GUID, which is required for the, the app attach. The package name and our parent folder. Also an awesome thing is you can filter host pools and you can filter users or groups. I changed this a little bit to um, allow users uh, to make it more uh, clear in a demo. Now this is the deployment from version 7.7.1. Um, our awesome developer came in and he had a brand new version. Uh, so we have to update uh, from 7.7.1 to the new and uh, latest version. So let's go into our package. Let me quickly copy the latest version from our developer. So we will introduce the 7.8.5 version, the latest version. In our notepad, in our uh, Visual Studio code, we can already see the two new files, but we also have to change our JSON file, of course. Let me change this. Latest one. So now we describe that we will use the 785, which we will be pushing uh, here as well. New volume GUID, the new package name, and the new parent folder. The same users will be applied. If you look at our branch, which will be changed, this is still master. We're not going to change the master, of course. We're going to create a new, and let's call it update. Notepad plus. So now we're in the branch feature update Notepad plus plus. We will commit it. Update to Notepad seven eight five. We're going to commit, and we will be push to our Azure repo. If you look at our Azure repo, for this, it's still not changed because this is our master branch and our master branch is not changed because we created a new feature. As you can see, Azure repo is saying, okay, you just updated a new branch. Do you want to create a pull request? This is something we will do now. So we are going to pull our change into the master. You can also see what is changed. We added two new binaries, so our VHD and MSX file, and also the change to the JSON file for the new uh, version of our MSX. Going to create a pull request. Normally in large enterprises, this would be unthinkable that I would approve and complete myself. It would be normally a 4i principle or a 6i principle. Um, but for the demo part, I will do it all for myself. Um, and it looks great, so let's just complete the merge. Now that it's merged, the CI will kick in. So I created a simple build. Um, if you look at the build, it will simply copy the packages, so the MSX and VHD into a packages folder and copy all the JSON files into the scripts folder. So it remains the same structure, but it just copies it and publishes this into our artifacts. If everything goes well, our new build, the update to 785, 
should be triggered and it's already completed. And as you look at the log, it's it includes now the 771 and 785 PhD into the package, and it's already published into the artifact. After the build is complete, it will also trigger the release because it's a CI CD pipeline. So the delivery deployment will also kick in. If you look at our release, we just refresh, then you can see that our release two is triggered. It is already deploying. Before I go into that, let me show you what it does. It's a really simple CI CD pipeline. We have our artifact from our build. We have three tasks, and the three tasks include stopping the session host, get a storage account key, upload to new files, and start the session host again. If you look at the progress, it is now stopping our virtual machine because we need to deregister the old version, register the new version. Now it's a really hard shutdown. So it is really stopping our virtual machine. As you can see now, my MSX session host is stopped. I intentionally did not deallocate it just to speed up the process. So it is simply stopped, which is sufficient. And if you look again to our pipeline, it is now uploading our new files into our storage account. So now the 785 version of our MSIX package is being uploaded to our storage account. In a normal situation, the stopping process would not be that fast. You would um, include in your release pipeline that all users get an, uh, uh, a message indicating that an update is coming. They need to save or close the, the session and they can just simply re, um, restart their sessions on a new session host. But for demo purposes, it's a hard shutdown. The upload is done and the start from the session host is also done. If we take a quick peek, then we will see in the packages our new files on our share. Also, our apatest file is just changed. It's 11 now on my domain controller. If you look at the code, it is indeed 785 describing the version. And if we now launch our session again to our session host, we should see that instead of the old 771 version of Notepad, the new 785 version. Is streamed or is app attached for our user. Again, for this user, it's completely seamless because uh, both registering and staging is done using crew policy. So the user will not see any PowerShell script launching, will not see anything. It's simply done using the GPO. Notepad is available again. And as you can see, we're running 785 as a version at this moment, latest build that is available. So now all our users can start using the latest build from the MSIX package. All right, thank you for that awesome demo, uh, Micha. That was, uh, that was amazing. So uh, I think we're close to uh, our deadline, so let's uh, start to wrap it up. So uh, we can share with you this uh, this roadmap of what is uh, is coming. We are not able to attach any dates uh, to this, but this is the process of what is going to become available uh, in the near future. So we'll see uh, some integration uh, of Windows Virtual Desktop with uh, MSIX App Attach uh, in the ARM portal, of course, using the, the new uh, the new agents. And of course, uh, after that, we'll see a new private preview of MSAX App Attach uh, with Windows Desktop integrated uh, and a public preview of uh, that technology. So to wrap it up, we have uh, a call to action for you. If you are interested in this technology, if you want to get started and get your hands dirty with technology right now, it's available for public preview. Uh, go and visit one of these URLs uh, to get started. 
And uh, with that, um, let's take a look at the summary we just uh, saw. So hopefully um, this will finally um, fulfill the promise to have a full isolation between the WVD host and any application, any user profile and any user data, uh, which allows us to have full separation between user data, between applications and the actual session host server. So with that, we want to thank you for your uh, attention. I hope you enjoyed uh, the content and please stick around for the rest of the session. We have some great content uh, coming up. Um, and so Mika, do you have any famous last words? <laughs> uh, yeah, normally um, at this uh, at this stage, uh, the, the audience is, is uh, giving us an applause because it's a virtual uh, session. We just added the Cloud and the applause ourselves. <laughs> I don't know if we have still have time for questions, um, Christian. Um, yeah, so uh, we 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 have a question Q and A coming, and already like we've already like overwhelmed amount of questions around MSAX and all the great content that you guys presented. So thank you for that. And let's just uh, yeah switch over to uh, to Thomas Popogard. So, uh, if you do, you have anything more to to share, Frick or Misha, before we uh, hand it over to to Thomas? No, that's it. I just want to thank everyone to, for uh, for attending. And if there are additional questions, uh, uh, feel free to also um, uh, follow up on either of us using Twitter or email. Uh, that's perfectly fine.